Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Asia Society. My name is Josette Sheeran, and I'm president and CEO of the Asia Society. And I want to thank you all for being here for this special event. I want to thank especially those Asia Society trustees and United Nations ambassadors who join us here this morning. Welcome. Today, we're honored to welcome the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, to address the escalating crisis in Syria and Iraq and in the region. And we're particularly honored today to have uh, Madam Ban Ki-moon here with us today. Welcome here to Asia Society. The uprising began much the way the other uprisings of the so-called Arab Spring began. A small spark, protests calling for democratic reforms, then a brutal crackdown, deaths and more protests. The first Arab uprisings in Tunisia and then in Egypt saw leaders overthrown within weeks. In Syria, there was no overthrow. Instead, an ever bloodier crackdown, a more violent and fractured opposition, and then the inflow of jihadi fighters from throughout the world, and with them, more violence, and the tragic turning of what was once the plea of citizens for a greater voice in the future of their nation into what is unfolding as a war between sects of Islam and now threatens the stability of an entire region. It's now been more than three years. More than 150,000 people have been killed. The brutal violence has triggered a diaspora of suffering. Millions of women, men, and children having seen their shops, their homes, and their dreams hijacked by extremists on all sides. Today, the United Nations Humanitarian Appeal, something close to my heart as the former head of the United Nations World Food Program, which is voluntarily funded by the generosity of member states uh, and would provide a minimum of food, shelter, and medicine to traumatized populations, is shamefully underfunded. This week, one cannot but think that the past three years of this conflict may seem simple given what is now rapidly unfolding. A blitzkrieg across the Syria border and toward Baghdad by a group of armed Sunni jihadists so radical that they were expelled by Al-Qaeda. This group called ISIS or ISIL, the Islamic State, really for greater Syria, which includes in their book Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, southern Turkey, and beyond. They have successfully seized the largest city in northern Iraq and left a trail of terror in their indiscriminate executions and beheadings of civilians or any others who cross their path. In an era where what happens in the village is immediately known to the world, they post their victories in gruesome videos via Twitter and YouTube calling for others to gather and take up arms. To met today, many turn to the United Nations to help lead the way out of this cycle of violence. Ban Ki-moon is the United Nations' eighth Secretary General, only the second ever from Asia. He has faced perhaps the most challenging set of crises and scenarios since the founding of the United Nations following two horrific world wars 60 years ago. He took office in January 2007 and almost immediately faced the unfolding of the financial food and fuel crisis and displayed extraordinary leadership, not only within the UN system to bring us all focused and together to tackle those, but bringing the world together in joint action. And the crises keep hitting, now from rising tensions in the South and East China Seas the crisis in Ukraine, and now the Middle East, perhaps potentially the most frightening of all. This far, thus far, good answers and meaningful action have eluded the world. Today he will give his remarks and then take your questions. You should all have received question cards uh, on your way in. Please, if you have a question, place it on the card and to the staff at the end of the row, and they'll be passed up to me on the stage, and we'll be able to ask the Secretary General. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Secretary General of the United Nations. We're honored to have you here at Asia Society.
Thank you, uh, Ms. Jose Shuran, President of the Asia Society, for your warm welcome and kind introduction. Distinguished Executive uh, Bo Trusteeship Board Council, uh, members of the trustees, Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be hosted by this uh, very prestigious Asia Society today to talk with you and listen to your views on some of the very important and very tragic crisis which is happening uh, in this world. And I'm very glad to see Joseph Shiran, our former colleague of the United Nations, taking this very important uh, responsibility as president of Asia Society. You know how dynamic and great leader she was. Uh, she has been involved in Syrian crisis, uh, in delivering uh, to many millions of people, uh, to needy people. And it's only uh, natural that uh, I'm having this opportunity at the invitation of Je Joseph Shiran uh, in this Asian society. I wish her all the best. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here <clears throat> to highlight the worsening of the already horrifying a situation and tragedy which is happening in Syria, which continues to bleed uh, beyond its borders. I'm here to express my anger and disappointment at the cold calculation that seems to be taking hold that little can be done except to arm the parties and watch the conflict rage the international community must not abandon the people of Syria and the region to never-ending waves of cruelty and crisis. We must act. All the values for which we stand and all the reasons for which the United Nations exist are at stake. Here and now, across the devastated landscape that is Syria today. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by recognizing the full scale of catastrophe which is happening now in Syria and in the region. The death toll may be well over 150,000. Since June last year, when High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pile, announced around 100,000 death, then United Nations has not been issuing any further statistics of death at all. It's impossible, and it's very sad and tragic to count all these dead bodies. At least 200, 300, or several hundred people are dying every day. Half the country's population of 22 million being displaced. Nearly three million people have been accommodated by the neighboring countries, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Turkey, and Egypt, and in uh, no North Africa. As of yesterday, June 19, the number of uh, refugees registered by the UNHCR stands 2.97 million. It's almost three million. It will grow. Prisons and makeshift detention facilities are swelling with men, women, and even children. Death by summary executions and unspeakable torture are widespread every day. Uh, people are dying from hunger and from once rare infectious diseases. Whole urban centers and some of the humankind's great architectural and cultural heritage lie in ruins. Destruction and death are everywhere. It did not have to be this way. Everybody agrees. Then why this situation continues like this way? In 2011, when some thousands of Syrians went to the street, and peacefully, and fill the squares of Dara and elsewhere in Syria. 
They were not calling for regime changes. They were calling Huria, the freedom. And they were not calling, they were not staging any revolutions. They just wanted reforms after many decades of uh, dictatorial and authoritarian re regime. The response of the authorities was merciless. Snipers and tanks firing indiscriminately into the crowds. Appeals to President Assad from the people and from the region fell on deaf ears. As popular demands escalated, the government's reaction turned even more ferocious. Civilians took up arms only at that time. Civilians turned against each other. Regional powers became involved. Radical groups gained a foothold. Syria today is increasingly a failed state. The United Nations has tried hard to address the conflict's deep roots and devastating impact. Despite the severe limits on access imposed by the warring sides, we have launched humanitarian oper operations of enormous scale. And I thank the many member states who have generously been providing very generous assistance. Our human rights machinery has been scrupulously monitoring, documenting, and condemning atrocities. Our disarmament teams have worked with the OPCW, Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, to destroy one of the world's largest chemical weapons arsenals. This work is saving lives and reducing sufferings, but our fundamental objectives on end to the conflict remains unmet. Divisions within Syria, the region, and international community, even within, within the United Nations, and continued arms flows continues to fuel the conflict. These bleak prospects have darkened further with the flare of violence and sectarian tensions in Iraq. <coughs> Suddenly, the cohesion and integrity of two major countries, not just one, is in question. The time is long past for the international community, in particular the Security Council, to uphold its responsibilities. In that spirit, I offer the following six points that can chart a principled and integrity way forward to international action. Ladies and gentlemen, first, the immediate priority of the United Nations is to end the violence. The government's indiscriminate use of barrel bombs, scud missiles, and artillery, and mortar attacks by the opposition forces, and terrorist tactics by extremists highlight the urgent need to stop the killing and destruction. Governments that hope to regain legitimacy do not massacre their own people. It is essential to stem flows of arms pouring into the country. It is irresponsible for foreign powers and groups to give continued military support to parties in Syria that are committing atrocities and flagrantly violating international principles of human rights and international law. I urge the Security Council to impose an arms embargo if divisions in the council continues to prevent such a step, I urge country to do so individually, whatever they can, to impose this arms embargo. Syria's neighbors should enforce a firm prohibition on the use of their, their land borders and air spaces for arms flows and smuggling into Syria. I recognize that 
an arms embargo at this time would risk freezing an imbalance in place, given the extent and capacity of a Syrian government weaponry. But the Syrian war cannot be won by military means. The sides will have to sit across from each other, again at the negotiating table. The only question we can pose is how many more people must die before they can sit together? Increasing numbers of Syrians are taking matters into their own hands and negotiating agreements to stop the fighting in their own neighborhoods. These local agreements may be imperfect because some are a result of co coercion and deliberate starvation. However they came about, they indicate a desire of desperate communities to end their suffering and receive international relief. Ladies and gentlemen, second, the international community must do its utmost to protect people. Their human rights, their human dignity, their safety and security. The United Nations is providing food for four million people every month. A polio vaccination campaign reached more than three million children in all 14 governorates. With courage and impartiality, UN relief workers and their partners, including the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, the International Committee of Red Cross, and other NGOs will continue to help Syrians in need. But 4.7 million people are in hard to reach areas. The government has actively removed the medical supplies from aid convoys and has collectively punished the communities it regards as sympathetic to opposition. Some rebel groups have taken similarly. The recent drop in the volume of assistance is directly linked to complicated bureaucratic procedures imposed by the government. I appeal for an end to sieges and for immediate unfettered humanitarian access across international front lines and across the borders. The international community has provided barely a third of the funding needed for the relief efforts. Additional member states need to step forward. I'm appealing to uh, many other potential additional member states, in addition to traditional uh, donors, uh, to come forward with their generous uh, assistance. I also call on the Syrian government, as well as armed opposition and extremist group, to immediately release all individuals who have been arbitrarily uh, detained. President Assad, in fact, uh, recently expressed his intention to authorize a significant release of detainees. I call on him to follow through on that uh, commitment. Third, we desperately need new efforts to start a serious political process for a new Syria. The Geneva communique of June 30th, 2012, set out a clear roadmap for a democratic political transition by establishing a transitional governing body with the full executive power. And it remains the basis for any peaceful settlement. However, the warring parties systematically blocked the tireless efforts of two of the world's most brilliant and experienced diplomats, Kofi Annan and Lakta Brahimi. Diplomacy seems to have stopped in its tracks. <clears throat> the presidential election, which was held earlier last year, earlier this month, was a further blow uh, to the political process. The election did not meet even minimal standards for credible voting and has created a fact that runs counter uh, to the Geneva communique. I will soon name 
a new special envoy. That person will have a mandate to pursue a political solution, but will not be able to wave a magic wand. Much painstaking effort and cooperation will be needed from all of you, from governments and particular regional powers and Security Council members and civil society. The Special Envoy will strive to advance the UN's protection agenda and will work with the parties and their regional backers in a search for new elements on which to build some hope of a political process. Diplomacy by the United States and Russian Federation helped to bring the sides to table in the first place. We had the two rounds of Geneva Conference in addition to conference in Montreux, Switzerland. I urged them and all the members of the Security Council to re-engage in this political process. Regional countries have a special responsibility to help end uh, this war. I welcome recent contacts between Iran and Saudi Arabia and hope that they will build confidence and reverse a destructive competition in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and elsewhere. Let me also underline and salute the important efforts being made by Syrian civil society to maintain the fabric of society and keep open channels of solidarity and communication. These courageous women and men have much to contribute. Their voices must not be drowned out by the incessant sound of voice, of violence. Fourth, any peace process will have to ensure accountability for serious crimes. The Syrian people have a fundamental right to justice. The United Nations and its member states have a duty to defend that right. Earlier this year, the Commission of Inquiry established by the Human Rights Council concluded that the International Criminal Court is the appropriate venue, venue to pursue the fight against impunity in Syria. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, Nad Pillay, has repeatedly called on the Council to refer the situation in Syria to the ICC. However, last month, the Security Council did not vote to authorize such a step. I ask those member states standing in the way of such a referral to consider the message this sends about their commitment to accountability. I ask those who say no to the ICC, but who say they support accountability in Syria to come forward with the credible alternatives. If not today, then someday, the perpetrators will surely be called to account. No side is innocent in this conflict, government or opposition. And there is no statute of limitations for the heinous crimes we have seen. Ladies and gentlemen, the Syrian conflict has also been the arena for the first use of weapons of mass destruction in the 21st century. Our fifth imperative is to finish the destruction of chemical weapons in Syria. Despite the great challenges and security difficulties, 92% of chemical weapons registered by Syrian government has been removed and destroyed completely. We have about 8% of chemical weapons which have been identified and which have been packed and ready to be moved out. But simply because of current ongoing security situations, we are not able to bring them out. But even though we may not be able to meet the target of June 30th, just 10 days ahead from now, we will continue to do that. This work will continue beyond the original deadline 10 days from now 
there have been since additional allegation about the use of toxic chemicals such as chlorine. We are all keenly aware that almost all of the killings in Syria is being done with chemical weapons. Still, it is essential to reinforce the global norm, banishing the production and use of chemical weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, sixth and finally, we must address the regional dimensions of the conflict, including the extremist threat. Syria's neighbors are showing remarkable resilience and generosity in hosting the huge number of refugees. But even as the Syrian displacement continues to increase, the Iraq crisis threatened to lead to new displacement. The already heightened economic, social, and political strains in recipient countries could intensify. The conflict has created fertile ground for radical armed groups from within and outside Syria, including Hezbollah and those affiliated with or inspired by Al-Qaeda or other extremist groups. Foreign fighters are in action on both sides. This has increased the level of violence and exacerbated sectarian violences. The Syrian government is demonized the opposition as a terrorist. But many of the armed opposition groups want to be a part of political solution. Some have endorsed the Geneva communique. At the same time, no one should be blind to the serious threat posed by terror groups in Syria. Whatever the differences on the country's political future, the world must come together to eliminate funding and other support for organi organizations designated as a terrorist group by the Security Council, including Jabhat al-Nusra and the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham. Al the Syrian conflict has now spread visibly and devastated, devastatingly to Iraq with the flows of arms and fighters across a porous border. Here too, while responding to a very real danger, one must also guard against a narrative that fails to see the legitimate grievances of all countries' people and pursues a sectarian agenda. Developments in the past few days make it all too easy to imagine a spiral of attack and reprisal not seen, in Iraq, not seen in Iraq since 2006 and 2007. The Sunni extremists of ISIS are trying to show that the governments in Baghdad, Iran, and the United States are working together to support atrocities against Sunnis. This perception would help them mobilize support from the Sunni majority that does not share the extremist agenda. It is essential that government of Iraq and its supporters do everything possible to avoid falling into this trap. Military strikes against ISIS might have little lasting effect or even be counterproductive if there is no movement toward inclusive government in Iraq. It is imperative for the government and its backers to ensure that no reprisals are carried out against the Sunni communities in revenge for the barbaric acts by ISIS. The ISIS is a threat to all communities in Iraq. All should now work together. Moderate Sunnis should make it clear that they are against terrorism. Kurds should not be seen as disengaging or benefiting from this ongoing chaos. And Shias, they should agree that the army is a national institution. 
Sectarian warfare is a disaster for all. It generates a vicious circle of polarization and terrorism. It is crucial for the region's leaders, political and religious, to call for restraint and avoid further, further contagion. I hope other countries, including Saudi Arabia and Iran, as well as other regional governments, can find ways to build bridges that promote calm and reconciliation. The United Nations and I personally stand ready to take any initiative that those leaders would find helpful. The region is already wrestling with dramatic transition and the fallout of unrealized aspirations. The risk of massive sectarian violence beyond the national borders compels us all to go to extra miles for peace. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, these six elements can point the way forward, provided there is a strong backing by the warring parties and all those with influence over them. For the moment, the greatest obstacle to ending the Syrian war is the notion that it can be won militarily. I reject the current narrative that the government of Syria is winning. Conquering, conquering territory uh, through aerial bombardment into densely populated civilian neighborhoods is not the victory. Starving besieged community into surrender is not the victory. No one is winning. No one can win. Even if one side will prevail in the short term, the devastating toll will, be sown, will have sown the seeds of future conflict. <clears throat> to the Syrian people, I say to the Syrian people, the United Nations will not give up in trying to help you restore peace in your country. To the member states of the United Nations, my appeal is this. You must put your differences aside, uphold your responsibilities, and work with the United Nations to end this tragedy. Ladies and gentlemen, not long ago, I, have an, I had an opportunity of um, visiting the opening ceremony of the renovated Islamic galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, just across from here. A great many of the treasures were from either Syria and Iraq. I was inspired by their long and very proud civilizations. At the same time, I was deeply saddened to think of the suffering those countries and people are experiencing today and of the destruction of thousands of years of cultural heritage in just a few years of fighting. Let us recognize the unimaginable suffering that abounds to today. And let us work together now to build a better future for the people of Syria and people in the region. This is our moral and political responsibility for all of us and I count on your leadership and vision for a better future for all of us. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. And I, I certainly know from observing you when you were my boss uh, at the United Nations that sometimes from the outside it looks easier than from the inside uh, to really influence the course of events and have an impact. And yet you've laid out a good six-point plan. Uh, and as you pointed out, there's been some victories, such as the removal of many of the chemical weapons from Syria and the destruction, uh, U.S. and Russia bringing people to the table, and also the Geneva communique. 
and uh, that you plan to have a new envoy uh, soon to work on these issues. I'd like to ask you about how much of a game changer is the advances of ISIS? They now have a territory about the size of the state of Indiana in the U.S. that they've seized. And has this morphed now into a different kind of conflict? And will this require um, perhaps a different approach? Um, have, have we yet fully understood the dimensions of the new developments across the border? One uh, very important lessons uh, from this uh, current crisis, uh, allowing extremist elements uh, to uh, in infiltrate in this already mm -hmm. difficult situation, is that, the, first of all, the leaders of the country is concerned. Uh, they should have uh, reached out to all the groups of people, whether religious or ethnicity, but somehow, there are many such cases we have seen that they have not reached out. They have not been embracing all the people. Through election, a seemingly a democratic, a peaceful election, they believe that they have uh, full legitimacy. But election is a very important part that in democratic uh, processes. But that does not give a full authorization or authority or legitimacy. Mm. That should be accompanied by good governance and anti-corruption anti and reaching out and listening to all the aspirations and grievances and discontent of our people. They should have listened very carefully what exactly uh, people are, mm -hmm. are speaking. That's exactly what is happening now in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And I've been urging as in my meeting and as well as a telephone call most recently to uh, President, uh, Prime Minister uh, Maliki, uh, he should now, even though it may be late, but it's not too late, he should reach out to uh, all the, all the fac factors of the society, political and economic uh, society. But well, we have seen uh, so many uh, uh, problems, uh, disharmonious, disharmonious uh, uh, political relationship. That's said. Now, uh, now that these extremist groups have uh, infiltrated and taken a foothold, then the international community must address decisively taking all necessary measures uh, to uh, stem uh, these uh, terrorist groups. This is uh, a common responsibility which we have to do. This may happen in any other countries. Well, we have many questions coming in. I also want to welcome our viewers on uh, the internet and through Twitter and elsewhere, and they're also sending in questions, so keep them coming up. But let me just ask you, were you encouraged by your phone call with uh, Al Malaki, and what did he say about um, the ability to bring people together? Do you, do you see some good signs there? Uh, recently, I have been uh, meeting. I met the uh, first vice president of Iran, the, Mr. Jahangir, and I spoke to foreign minister, then I, I spoke to a prime minister of Iraq and Iranian leaders, and I've been really trying to urge the leaders in the, in the region uh, to show their solidarity. Of course, the you know, United Nations has already uh, shown publicly that we stand behind the Iraqi people in fighting uh, against the terrorist, terrorist groups and also helping them restore uh, peace and stability. Now, um, I know that uh, the countries in the region are really trying to uh, consider what would be the best way to uh, address uh, this situation. In the course of this, uh, I would encourage you know, to reach out to uh, all the groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have a couple questions up here already. Um, First one says, you said that uh, the new envi envoy would not have a magic wand, but would have a mandate to try to find a political solution. And the question is, won't he or she be hampered by two of the points if there's an embargo that keeps the regime's advantage in place and also a call for war crimes prosecution, which cannot help uh, bring Mr. Assad to the table? So... 
How do you feel these will come into the mix of trying to find a political solution? The special envoy, uh, when the appointed uh, uh, in the near future, will have to first uh, reach out and consult with uh, key member states in the region and key member states of the Security Council. And uh, I will strongly encourage uh, him or her to do that. And there are many, many other uh, uh, you know, issues which one will have to deal with. Unfortunately, during the last uh, two, two years or so, uh, uh, since uh, Kofi Annan and uh, Lakta Brahimi, uh, because of the division, even in the region, uh, they were not given full support, full support politically, uh, let alone the financial uh, support. Uh, uh, this has been quite a regrettable one, even though it has not been publicly uh, known. I, I, I see some uh, gradual changes in the region, uh, knowing that the way they have been doing, uh, first of all, divided, and uh, the way also they have been, some individual countries have been uh, providing arms uh, to either side, uh, was not uh, you know, making you know, uh, any, any uh, solutions, and leading, not leading to solutions. I see some gradual changes. Therefore, I believe is my. I hope my uh, observation is right. The, the future special envoy may have a better chance, a better chance, uh, to succeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> what would you specifically hope? Uh, question reads: uh, The United States government would do now to reduce the crisis in Syria. In both in uh, Syria and Iraq, uh, U.S. as uh, undoubtedly, you know, uh, one of the big uh, uh, superpower has a role to play as one of the two initiating countries uh, on political solution uh, together with the Russian Federation. Uh, I have been urging to uh, Secretary Kerry and uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov that uh, they should uh, do more in. Uh, exercising influence uh, and demonstrating their leadership. In the height of the uh, Ukrainian situation, my, my difficulty and concern was that uh, most of the world leaders' attention was given on the Ukrainian situation. Uh, my message to uh, President Putin and all other European and American leaders has been that you are effectively uh, binding my hands it's important. The Ukrainian situation is a very important. It should be addressed. But at the same time, you should never lose sight of what is happening in Syria, what is happening in Central African Republic and the South of Sudan. And there is a much broader, more important issues of uh, future development issues, like a sustainable development and climate change. Nobody is now talking about uh, climate change and so South of Sudan and Central African Republic, let alone even on Syria. So I've been expressing my concerns to them. Please do more. I will support on Ukrainians' situation, but at the same time, let's do it together. Let's do it comprehensively, address all the issues. That's my message to uh, American uh, leadership. At the same time, uh, there is <coughs> a very uh, serious issue uh, which is happening now in Iraq. Uh, I think the uh, international community should uh, uh, show a strong solidarity to Iraqi uh, people. They have suffered long. Now, only after a uh, few years when uh, the, the departure, the withdrawal of American forces, now they are uh, experiencing such a difficulty. So we should show uh, some solidarity and support to them. Mm -hmm. And the question... Um the U.S. and Iran are on the precipice of a possible deal to end the nuclear standoff. And there's been some talk among U.S. leaders that Iran could possibly play a constructive role in the current crisis in northern Iraq, uh, given that it uh, um, uh, particularly is close to the Shia elements um, in Iraq that may feel threatened by that. What, what is your message to Iran right now about the possible role it could play? 
in Syrian situation and current uh, Iraqi situation, Iran is and can play a very important role. So we need to uh, get support uh, and their uh, very proactive uh, and supporting role uh, to, first of all, diffuse attention and address all these uh, issues. In that regard, uh, I was encouraged to hear that uh, American uh, and uh, Iranian representatives were meeting informally uh, on the margins of um, uh, Vienna nuclear uh, deals, that is uh, good. Uh, I think they should, be, uh, they sh- they should continue uh, to have this kind of um, uh, dialogue, if not official, but even informally, uh, to get the uh, Iranians involved. That is an encouraging mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. And um, what about the role of Saudi Arabia? Are you hopeful that they also can play a leadership role in addressing this? Saudi, uh, Saudi is a very important uh, regional power, and I have been also uh, very closely working with the Saudi king and foreign minister and their representatives. In dealing with the Syrian uh, situation, they may have a little bit different uh, positions, uh, but largely they have been uh, supporting now Uh, In the Iraqi situation, in the Syrian situation, in most of the uh, situation in the Middle East, uh, I I sincerely hope that uh, Saudi Arabia will continue to play a very uh, positive and constructive role. Uh, We need uh, their their support. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary General, I have uh, many, many questions here. I'm going to try to merge a couple. One Um, There seems to be quite a focus on ISIS and their emergence. And there's a question um, around the flow of money and arms into the region. And realistically, can we expect there to be an embargo? And because who controls the gates now to the flow? That isn't it so diffuse, including a question on um, uh, funding uh, into ISIS. Um, so, w- who are the gatekeepers, and how how do we uh, how do we deal with that challenge? Well, one should know that uh, for a certain uh, political purpose, uh, one may think that it would be beneficial for them to provide the arms or funding to a certain group, but they should also understand that in the end. Uh, this may backfire and come back to them themselves. So just supporting or providing funding and arms to all these terrorist extremist group like ISIS, this is, uh, I think, uh, is not, that should be stopped uh, all the times. At the same time, uh, this is uh, relating to my first uh, remarks that the when leaders are not reaching out to the people and all various uh, different different groups, this will allow a certain you know space where uh, extremist elements may uh, may play as a breeding ground that we have to guard against. Mm-hmm. Uh, therefore, uh, inclusive and reconciliatory uh, reaching out to all the group of people, particularly um, uh, civil society and religious groups, uh, by doing that, I think we can prevent uh, any potential potential, uh, uh, breeding ground of uh, extremist group. Mm -hmm. The arms embargo, I I said that uh, when it comes to uh, Syria, uh, there is uh, some political divisions. Uh, in the Security Council and in the United Nations and the region. Uh, but it's a known fact that you know, countries, uh, many countries are providing either side according to their own you know, political uh, thinking. Uh, and when we urge them to impose arms embargo, uh, then may create some, some imbalance in current uh, situation, particularly uh, for the opposition groups because of the 
massive uh, weaponry uh, capacity of uh, Syrian government. So it may be, uh, uh, if there is going to be total in, em, em, arms embargo, it may be imbalance. Uh, but as I said, there is no such uh, a military win. Uh, only political solution uh, can bring this uh, to uh, eventual and peaceful uh, solution of this issue. <laughs> So, Mr. Secretary, there's a question about the frustrations of the last envoy, Mr. Brahimi. And as you know, he was frustrated and didn't feel the international community was taking it seriously enough, felt what he called there was a total failure of the international community, um, and that Syria may become another Somalia. Do you feel that the international community is taking the situation more seriously now? If so, why? And uh, if not, um, why not? <laughs> First of all, uh, this is quite uh, dramatic uh, uh, situations which we have been seeing now. Uh, not in the past uh, have we seen uh, so many crises uh, taking place all at once. Mm -hmm. It's not only Syria. We have so many crises in uh, Africa. Uh, South Sudan and Central African Republic and Mali, Democratic Republic of Congo and Great Lake regions. There are so many areas. Then Libya is also in very much a difficult position. Uh, after a uh, very dramatic transformation after this Arab Spring, uh, many of the countries are also suffering from these uh, uh, aftershocks of uh, transformations. Syria is one that we have uh, Ukraine situation. Therefore, it is a very difficult uh, situation for international community to, to handle all this matter. In the course of this uh, dealing with this, many countries have different perspectives. And uh, we have seen so many uh, divisions uh, in Syria and in many other issues. Therefore, what is important is that political leaders should have a very uh, long-term a vision and should be united, united. We need the one voice and one measure uh, to address all these issues. Uh, it may be very general uh, the way I am speaking, but I, I may not be able to go one by one. But generally speaking, we need the political leadership, uh, political leadership mm -hmm. and with a strong solidarity uh, for the peace and also human rights uh, and humanitarian uh, situation. We have seen uh, tremendously uh, very tragic uh, human rights violations. And this accountability justice system has not been brought to all the cases. Therefore, United Nations takes it very seriously that if not today, we'll make sure that these uh, perpetrators will have to be brought to justice and that is why recently I have uh, initiated rights up front. Yes, when it comes to human rights, everything will be brought up front, ahead of, uh, above any, anything. So that kind of uh, vision uh, should be shared and supported by all 193 member states and supported by civil society. Yeah. That's the only way we, we can address these issues. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary, you have a question from Eugenia, a student at NYU, and she wants to know about the children of Syria. Mm -hmm. And of course, the UN has a very important mandate with children, with UNICEF and Tony Lake's leadership there and all of that. And she's worried, as the whole world is, about education, uh, let alone food and shelter and uh, removing them from trauma. But uh, what are your, your thoughts about this particular tragic element mm -hmm. in this? I visited many uh, refugee camps in Jordan and uh, Turkey and Iraq. And my deputy secretary general visited Lebanon. Uh, wherever I visited, uh, I met uh, many children, young boys and girls. Very, I was saddened. Of course, you know, just looking at meeting refugees themselves is very sad and tragic. But when I saw all these young people, what have they 
done wrong. They do not know anything what is going on. But they are just suffering. What really inspired and impressed me was that United Nations has been providing uh, all what we can do. Uh, for example, we, made, uh, we constructed makeshift uh, schools. And even though this school classroom was very much crowded with 100 people, but still they were given textbooks and the teachers were teaching. And uh, there are many teachers among refugees and they were volunteering. That was quite a moving scene. And I told them that, uh, look, do not despair. Don't lose your hope. United Nations is helping you. I thought about my old days when I was a young a boy you know, without any classrooms after Korean War. Then I was studying on the, just the ground, on the dirt. I told them that, look, my situation was even worse than you are doing. You are now, at least you are studying uh, in these makeshift uh, classrooms. So United Nations is really uh, uh, providing all. As I said earlier in my statement, we have provided uh, th to three million children uh, vaccination. And I'm sorry to say that the new, uh, uh, this uh, polio has broken out in in Syria, because of these very dire sanitary, uh, sanitation conditions, but we are really trying our best. The UNICEF and UNDP, UNFPA, and all the UNHCR, WFP, uh, which you led, mm -hmm. uh, are doing our best efforts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary, I think this has to be our last question, but um, there's much debate uh, since we're at the point of 100 years after the First World War in 1914, and all the institutions primarily and centrally the United Nations set up to try to avoid a future where war was involved. And yet we hear statements recently, someone said the new world order is the new war order. There's so many wars and conflicts, as you've pointed out, breaking out. Are the tools of diplomacy and of um, peacemaking robust enough? And what, if you would share for a moment, your frustrations or your hope, uh, since we have so many dignitaries from the United Nations here and ambassadors, uh, do we have the tools we need for a world where the challenges are perhaps even more complex than they were a century ago? This year, 1940, uh, 2014 uh, may give us uh, good opportunities to, for us to look back what had happened 100 years ago, centennial uh, for First World War. And we have experienced this uh, very tragic, much, much more tragic Second World War. The United Nations was born after this uh, tragic uh, consequence of the Second World War. I believe that the uh, United Nations has been really doing during the last almost seven decades to prevent a such horrible war, which exper we, we experienced uh, many years ago. United Nations may not be perfect. Uh, being a multilateral organization uh, composed of all sovereign states, uh, all these uh, member states bring their own uh, visions and uh, their own systems even. But United Nations, in a largely saying, uh, has been working very well uh, to address all development issues and peace and security and human rights issues. Uh, one may still think that it's not perfect, we have not done enough. That I agree, I admit that we have not done enough. <clears throat> we have made a lot of um, pledges that we will never repeat this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Like uh, 20 years ago in Rwanda and 19 years ago in Srebrenica, there was a genocide. And we pledged ourselves that never again. But still, we are seeing the possibility of this uh, genocide in Syria and Central African Republic, even though I cannot term it as a genocide yet. Then there is a serious uh, crimes against the humanity then we should really make ourselves uh, united, not to see 
the occurrence, the reoccurrence of that kind of a tragedy. Uh, I know that uh, we are not perfect. That is why we are really trying to uh, uh, make our organization adapting to this uh, changing world. The one, one fact we have to know is that um, we are going through a dramatic transformation in terms of our whole li life, particularly global communication and technology really make us, uh, really compels us uh, to adapt to this uh, changing world. There is clearly boundaries uh, between national boundaries and international. There is a distinction between international and national. But one should know that uh, there is a great uh, transformation and shift is taking place under the feet, under their feet. That we should know that a lot of things are happening while we are standing on this. We then, our answer is quite clear. That we must be united. We must have a global, global vision. One should know that the good international global solution is good for their national solutions. Then there is, should be no such uh, distinction between international and uh, national. <laughs> And that is my, my message, and I've been speaking to young people, particularly students, that please, you do have a global vision. Forget about your national boundaries, national passports. We are only one global family, uh, very tightly, closely connected. Otherwise, we will not be able to have a sustainable development. Now, UN's vision is now to make this 21st century a sustainable world where nobody is left behind, where everybody's human rights and dignity is promoted and protected. Well, Mr. Secretary General, that was a very eloquent uh, statement. And I, I was struck when I served in the UN that many people feel you're all powerful and that indeed you have a magic wand. When you travel around the world, they think you can solve every problem. Would you like to set the record straight that maybe you're lacking all powers to fix all situations? <laughs> I'll try my best. I'll continue to do that. <laughs> Thank you.